Nature is full of amazing builders, birds, insects, fish, and even some mammals create incredible homes and structures. They're like nature's architects. We're going to take a closer look at four of these amazing builders and the incredible things they create. Get ready to be amazed by the skill and hard work of these animals as they make their homes in the wild. Our first animal is sort of the Antony Gaudi of the animal kingdom. Imagine stumbling upon what appears to be a colossal haystack suspended in a tree. But when you look closer at this organic structure, you see it's actually a bustling metropolis and home to a hundred birds. And not just any bird, it's a special bird called the sociable weaver. This little fluffball is a species of bird in the weaver family, endemic to southern Africa's Kalahari Desert. It's only 5.5 inches tall and weighs around one ounce. But don't let its unassuming brown feathers fool you. This little avian is a marvel of the natural world, setting itself apart with its unique architectural prowess. As sociable weavers construct their nests, they cleverly employ various materials for specific functions. Sturdy twigs serve as the roof, while dry grasses screen the chambers within. To safeguard against predators, sharp spikes of straw line the entrance tunnels. You see, these nests aren't just cozy homes, they're fortresses designed to repel intruders. From cunning Cape Cobras to aerial predators like the Pygmy Falcon, the sociable weavers have designed ingenious ways to protect their sanctuary. Inside, each nesting chamber is luxuriously lined with soft plant material, fur, cotton, and fluffy substances for comfort and warmth. In here, the birds can snuggle up and get cozy. And there's a lot of space to get cozy in. Sociable weaver nests can become so massive that they weigh several tons, sometimes causing the supporting tree or telephone pole to topple over. The biggest sociable weaver nests stretch over 20 feet wide and nearly 10 feet tall, housing over 100 individual nesting chambers. That's roughly the same size as a shipping container. But why do weavers build such large nests? This has something to do with the harsh conditions of the Kalahari Desert. When freezing winter nights set in, they huddle in the snug center chambers for warmth. And on scorching summer days, the outer chambers provide relief from the heat. In addition, the sociable weavers build large nests to house guests. Alongside the sociable weavers, other feathered friends, like the pied barbet, familiar chat, red-headed finch, ashy tit, and rosy-faced lovebird, find solace in the nest's cozy chambers. The sociable weavers love to share their home, hence the name, since more residents mean more eyes to watch for danger. It's all about safety and numbers. The sociable weavers are pretty good landlords as well. They're always busy fixing and adding to their nests, making sure they stay strong and cozy for their families. Some of these nests have been around for over a hundred years. It's safe to say that these birds are magnificent architects. Moving on to the next animal, which actually is a favorite snack of the sociable weaver, the termite. Although this isn't the harvester termite of southern Africa, but the compass termite, aka magnetic termite, in Australia's northern territory. If you ever find yourself on the verdant plains of northern Australia, an impressive sight awaits. Hundreds of grey wedge-shaped mounds rise against the vibrant green backdrop. These mounds, towering up to 13 feet tall, 8 feet wide, and over 3 feet deep, harbor a secret world within. Cars look tiny next to these giant mounds, and each one could house millions of compass termites, organized into colonies with a strict hierarchy, comprising a queen, king, reproductive adults, soldiers, and workers. The big mounds help keep a nice temperature inside for the termites. The mounds are constructed from a blend of soil, saliva, and dung, and shaped like wedges and placed in a certain direction so they can catch the sun's warmth in the mornings and evenings, but stay cooler during the hottest part of the day. From above, you might mistake it for a graveyard, since all are uniquely wedge-shaped and typically oriented north-south. This alignment helps regulate the underground nest's temperature, with the morning and evening sun warming the sides, while less surface area is exposed during midday, aiding in temperature control. These mounds also protect the termites from enemies in bad weather, keeping them safe and sound inside. The structure is indeed sturdy, and some termite mounds can remain active for decades or even centuries, continuously inhabited by successive generations of termite colonies. Humans have been inspired by termite mound design. In architecture and engineering, the principles of termite mound construction have been studied and applied to design energy-efficient buildings and ventilation systems. While humans have known about termite mounds for thousands of years, the next animal architect was only recently discovered. In 1995, a group of marine researchers discovered mysterious geometric patterns near the Japanese island of Amami. For years, the origins of these intricate formations remained a mystery, sparking speculation and intrigue within the scientific community. Some speculated that the formations were created by natural underwater currents or geological processes. 
Others wondered if they might be the result of unknown animal behavior or even human activity. It wasn't until over 15 years later, divers finally stumbled upon the elusive sculptor responsible for these underwater crop circles. A team of marine biologists encountered the tiny pufferfish as it diligently worked on crafting one of its intricate nests in the seabed. The little male Japanese pufferfish, only five inches long, surely shows impressive dedication. The pufferfish spend at least a whole week, day and night, making intricate designs in the sand by swimming through it. If they stop too soon, the currents wash away all their hard work. But there's a reason why the tiny Japanese pufferfish works this hard. It's not just a hobby, but an elaborate mating ritual of creating intricate patterns in the sand to attract a mate. The patterns serve as a display of the male's fitness and suitability as a mate. The male pufferfish meticulously constructs these designs, which can span several meters in diameter, using its fins and body movements to manipulate the sand in the seabed. Once completed, the construction resembles a series of concentric circles, stretching up to 6.5 feet wide, with raised areas and depressions spreading out from the center. Adding the final touches, the pufferfish carefully relocate fragments of coral and shell to beautify the outer edges of the pattern. Passing potential mates assess the males based on their construction skills. Upon making a choice, the females lay their eggs at the center. The exact reasoning behind this decision remains uncertain. One hypothesis suggests that a larger nest could indicate a stronger, more fit male. Both desirable traits to females. This is truly amazing, and some would argue that the Japanese pufferfish is an artist rather than an architect. The last animal with a seemingly master's degree in architecture is the North American prairie dog. Prairie dogs might seem small and unassuming, but they are highly skilled town developers, meticulously crafting complex underground burrow systems that serve as the foundation of their thriving communities. These complex burrow systems are called prairie dog towns, since they're basically designed as a human town. A burrow is like a home for one family, and it's next to other family burrows. Bunches of burrows are called coteries, which is like a close group of friends. A coterie is led by a grown-up male, a few females, and their babies. While a burrow usually has many doors, they aren't all connected. Imagine a prairie dog town is like a human town. We have different neighborhoods, and each one has separate houses. Most houses have more than one door. Prairie dog towns spread across many acres, with 5 to 35 dogs living on each acre. But before humans came into prairie dog areas, these towns were huge. For example, one town found in Texas in 1900 covered 25,000 square miles and had about 400 million prairie dogs living in it. That's an insanely large burrow system. One reason prairie dogs live in these big towns is for safety. With many members keeping watch for predators, they can warn each other and hide in their burrows if there's danger. About half of their time above ground is spent watching out for threats. Biologists studied the sounds prairie dogs make and found they have different calls for different types of danger and where it is. They even have separate calls for different humans. That's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you want more videos like this in the future, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Feel free to leave a comment below letting us know what topics you'd like to see next. Thanks for watching.